I know you're not a cult expert, but do you have any idea how we can get people out of this Trump cult? We probably can't get all, but maybe a sizable number. People send me emails about this all the time, and the problem that I have is that a lot of the rhetorical advice that you would need for convincing a friend or family member to, like, leave the Trump cult, it mostly comes down to how effectively you can identify their emotional pull and what you can do with it. It's not a logical argument bid. If you're a Trump supporter, it's not for logical reasons. That time is gone. It's not 2016 or 2017 anymore where there are maybe well-intentioned people who have the wrong information who are concerned about like, I don't know, employment or manufacturing jobs or whatever the fuck else, right? Like that, we don't live in an era where Trump is campaigning off of, at least in part, rational concerns or people are defending their support for Trump. People used to defend their support for Trump. Now they don't. One of the first things cults teach you is how to ignore the input of outsiders. Back in 2016, 2017, whatever, a weakness that the Trump campaign had is that there were people who voted for him who felt like they had to justify that vote. Now that doesn't really happen anymore. They just scream their same thought terminating cliches. They scream from the rooftops the same three or four talking points. They don't really engage. They don't meaningfully defend because... Uh, you know, if they had an attempt to logically defend Donald Trump would, you know, require a logical argument. And once you go down that road, it's kind of difficult to justify your support for Donald Trump. They train you with rejection, like Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on doors at 8 a.m. on a Saturday. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why Republicans value being oppositional in interpersonal settings so much. The reasons why they encourage you to wear your Trump hat, your Trump shirt, and call out your liberal family members on hate in America and so on. This doesn't happen from the liberal side of things. You know, Kamala Harris isn't, even though she should, Kamala Harris isn't going out there saying, yeah, on Thanksgiving dinner, you should like argue with your Trump supporting family members. That's, it doesn't go both ways. Trump supporters love being oppositional because being an oppositional jackass gives them the uh, conditioning they need to get used to being hated and get used to not feeling like your opinions are worth anything, if that makes any sense. That's the reason why Jehovah's Witnesses go door to door. Do you think they're going out there to convert you? How many conversions do you think they get? No. Jehovah's Witnesses are in a cult. They send young guys out there door to door because they want them to experience all of the wickedness and rudeness that non-believers will inflict on them for bothering them at 8 a.m. on a Sunday. That's the reason why. They want people to open up the door and go, ah, you have you, I don't care, slam, because after a thousand experiences like that, the Jehovah's Witnesses will go, wow, you're right, I guess, you know, the common folk are wicked, and those who don't follow the true way are, you know, uh, you know, damned for eternity, and that's why I should stay in my own bubble of a community where people treat me nicely, you know? It's basically the same with, that's why I'm not rude Je to Jehovah's Witnesses, you know? As a previous Jehovah's Witness, I can confirm, Vosh, you're perfectly correct, I did a Mormon mission, and the backfire effect was literally the point, yep, 100%, it's a cult. That's what they do. Cults will, uh, it, one of the parts of cult indoctrination, it's not just, oh, the cult is good. It's, let me remind you that everything else is bad. And the easiest way to do that is to convince a person in a cult that a position they hold that they think is true uh, is something they should express to others, which gets them blowback. And that means that they get like used to the idea that everyone else is kind of like essentially different, or at the very least, they're sinful or, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of like, they ain't like us, you know? And that's what the Trump supporting bit is like. So people email me and they're like, well, how do I convince my friend or family? And I'm really sorry, man. The God's honest answer is you're probably not going to. You're probably not going to. And I think a lot of you guys need to learn to let go. I don't think that's necessarily something you should do. I don't think that it's impossible to change their minds. I just think that the past eight years have basically been like the greatest possible conditioning that a political movement could have to insulate members of that movement from like reasonable inquiry and being convinced out of it, right? We're not dealing with logical arguments. So don't ask me for logical arguments. If logical arguments were capable of convincing your friends or family to not support Trump, they wouldn't support Trump. People, for the most part, arrive at their positions not from a logical assessment of their moral axioms and which, you know, normative behaviors contribute best to the... That's not how most people think, okay? They go off of vibes. It's median voter syndrome. They have a feeling, usually something like fear, insecurity, pride, something that, you know, like a gut feeling that they... That they, they got it right here and it's strong and it motivates their behavior and they build off of that. So a lot of, say, like we saw earlier in this stream, rural voters are very fearful about losing their way of life. They're fearful because they have lost their way of life, 
rural America is very different now to how it was 50, 60, 70 years ago. To be fair, America is different in general, but rural America has gotten worse. I would say that life in most areas in America, that is to say most areas where people live, cities, urban areas around cities, has gotten, for the most part, better. In rural areas, though, no, I don't believe that. So their way of life has changed. It has gotten worse. So who's to blame for that? Well, objectively, it has to do with uh, the globalized market, uh, big box stores, the you know brain drain, inequitable investment and resources and opportunities, the highway system. There are a lot of like objective things you can blame, and I've talked about all of these on my channel many times. But those are complicated, and the average person, not even the average like rural redneck hick or whatever, but the average person isn't going to sit down for an explanation on how the 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 you know the highway system is responsible for a lot of the harm done to rural America, you know, especially since many of them rely on highways to get around. So they need something to blame and they get immigrants, you know, they get like the coastal elites, they get, I don't know, wokeness, whatever. And this is the case for a lot of Trump voters. They're motivated by fear or insecurity or whatever else. You're not going to convince them with a logical argument. Go find somebody who unironically supports all of the misery and terror that would come about from deporting 20 million people in this country. The economic damage, the camps you'd have to build. Go find a person who believes in that, and then try to explain to them logically that illegal immigrants commit less crime on average than regular residents of the United States, and also that they contribute to the economy and don't harm their social security. Good luck. Good luck. It's the easiest thing in the world to fact check. You can literally Google it. Illegal immigration crime rates immigrant effect on local wages. Objective, clear as day data. If you want to get into the weeds, admittedly, any economic data is complicated, but the summaries are simple and it's not difficult. Has that changed their mind? No, it never works because you're not addressing the underlying feeling. And it's pretty difficult to change a person's feelings directly like that, especially because if they change their mind on it, they would have to admit that they've spent years in a cult, mindlessly hating people who have nothing to do with the problems they're concerned with. I'm not saying it's impossible to change the minds of folks that are that far gone, but you have to start by acknowledging they're that far gone. I have seen more success from people just cutting those kinds of people out of their lives than I have from fruitless efforts to change their minds, you know? To your parents or grandparents or whatever, hey, you're hateful and, uh, you know, you're not going to see my kids, you're not going to talk to me anymore as long as you're like this. I've seen that motivate more behavior than anything else. And that sounds cruel, but like, I don't know, just don't be a fascist skill issue, right? I, I like, I, I wish I could give a more optimistic answer to this. And I used to be able to give a more optimistic answer, but the Trump cult didn't always used to be like this. You know, well, the cult was only around for a few years back when I started this channel, the dynamic was different. More Trump supporters were willing to engage in a kind of like, ration like a you know a, a a reasoned explanation for why they feel the way they do i don't see that at all anymore it's the reason i don't do debates anymore it's it's genuinely a waste of time at the end of the day you know ideology is spread through power not through reason reason helps but power is what matters uh, you know, there is disproportionate right-wing control of the media sources that these people consume. Talk radio is one. They're out there in the sticks. They're listening to talk radio or on their, on their, on their, in their car. That shit's all Hitlerite, man. They're, they're Fox News, even parts of CNN these days, whatever Facebook circles they're in. I really do think the best shot you'd have of removing these people from the cult is removing these people from the cult. Now, I'm not saying you can take your 62 year old dad and go like yeah here i'm blocking facebook internet access for you but i i really do think that in a lot of cases people kind of conform to uh they, they 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 their opinions are shaped by the environment that they're in it is very easy to be a trump supporter in an environment where there are other trump supporters around you and you turn on the radio and it's blasting pro-trump radio and you turn on the tv and it's fox news you have your opinions coddled they're in a little bubble it's not as easy to be an out and about trump supporter in the cities which is why you see a lot of pro-trump signage out there in the sticks in cities you do not at least not in a lot of them and the reason for that is because you will rightly so be accused of being a hate monger if you publicly support donald trump in cities which is fair and reasonable because you are because <laughs> yeah because yeah, you are you know they tend to keep to themselves 
But it is a known fact that people are less likely to be racist if they spend time around other races. This is a, a, a fact doctors don't want you to know. This is a fact racists don't want you to know. The racist narrative is that white people are radicalized into racism by exposure to the blacks. Oh, I saw them and they were wearing their pants down and one of them used a contraction that I had never heard before. And that's when I joined the clan, you know, whatever, right? In reality, actual sociological investigation is consistently found that the more exposure you have to uh, black people, like your neighbors, you know, I mean, like you live around them, the less racist towards black people you're likely to be. Latin people, Asian people, whatever, same difference, you know? Same with gay people, trans people, non-binary people, Democrats, every group, every demographic. Exposure smooths away bigotry because bigotry festers most easily, most commonly in, uh, in ignorance, you know? If you never see a Mexican, you can believe or hear any bullshit about them and you'll buy it, you know? If you've never seen a black person or interacted with them and realized they're just regular folk, uh, you, you can be sold any narrative on them. You understand, don't you? So I think that if a lot of these people, Vosh, I think you misspoke. You said people are less likely to be racist if they're around other racists. Other races. A lot of these folks who are in the cult, the best shot of them getting out of it, I think, is just the discomfort of them being introduced to a new environment. You ever seen, a lot of you are younger than me, but this was still a phenomena back when I was in high school. You ever seen the guy who was like a piece of shit? Like a young guy, like maybe even a high schooler. Like a real asshole, but flippantly racist. And it's because they were in communities and forums which encourage that kind of behavior. And then they go to college and they're introduced to new groups of people that are not like that, that are good people. And there's this immediate culture shock where they're like, whoa, oh, I can't just like randomly make racist jokes. Okay. And a lot of them, and, and this isn't the narrative a lot of people want to go with, but it's true. A lot of them just let it go. A lot of them just stop. Because they weren't, like, committedly ideologically bigoted. They were bigoted because it was the easiest way to integrate and model the behavior of the environment they were already in. And once they enter a new environment, suddenly there are social pressures, which that's a lot of text for someone who's chatting right now. The social pressure uh, pushed in a different direction, and it was, it was easier to not be like that. That was me when I was isolated in high school and spent all my time in 4chan and YouTube. Yeah, I don't like it. When people email me, how do I change the mind of my such and such? Because first of all, let me live. It's a business email, man. I don't, I can't help all your problems. I can't fix your problems. And that's one. And for two, I really think it has more to do with your relationship to the individual whose mind you want to change and how you can better integrate them into an environment where that behavior isn't encouraged, you know? I, I, I genuinely think you're going to have more luck with that. And, and maybe, maybe it's not possible. After all, if we're talking like your parents or grandparents, you probably can't like, you probably can't do anything to adjust that. And if that's the case, I think you have to accept that in a lot of cases, letting them go is the better option. It really is. I'm sorry. I have seen so many testimonials from people who spent years suffering because they kept a, a thread attached to miserable, wretched bigots who attacked them or demeaned them for being gay, trans, a Democrat, interracial relationship, whatever. And then eventually they cut the line. And after that, it's like, oh, it, that's that. You're not the one doing the wrong thing there. If your parents want to not be horrible. They can. That's their choice to make. They're adults. They're more of adults than you are, definitionally. They're your parents. It's their responsibility. Maybe cutting them off will convince them. Maybe not. But either way, I think you owe it to yourself. It's more hurtful to hold on like a tight rope than to let go. Not only that, but you're also rewarding bad behavior. Don't you think? A little bit? I mean, if they can just treat you like shit on and on, and you just stick to them, I mean... What are they learning from that? My roommate did the same thing and had three people come back to them years later. I really do think it's the better option. Do you think this works with sexism? I, the, the, mo, genuinely, the worst sexists are people who just do not interact with women. 100%, yeah. Being in a friend group that has women in it just normally and just engaging with them as friends is one of the best green flags for a guy not being a weirdo sexist incel. Easily, yeah. 
the ability to engage with people who are different from you uh, as a friend is like the easiest, po it's the best possible thing that you can do for any kind of bigotry. 100%. I just, I, I don't know. I get these qu requests so often. It's just, the, the dynamic is different, you know? R slash QAnon casualties is a depressing subreddit to read. Yeah. I've been here a few times on stream. It's like um, my, my, my family member, Tim Walls is the dad a whole generation wished they had instead of the one they lost to Fox News. QAnon and Trump sent my friend into a downward spiral that eventually led to her death. Mom got in a huge fight at work about, you guessed it, Trump. My mom's best work friend is a black woman who she is very rudely at times talked down to me about. I told her time and time again, you do not talk politics at work, especially since she's a Trump supporter and partial Q, you'd think she'd be somewhat smart about the fact. Well, of course she has in the past told her friend and others who she supports. So yesterday my mom called me crying that her friend, quote, berated her after the black journalist conference demanding to know why she supports a racist. Instead of simply leaving the room because the woman was apparently yelling out of nowhere, not sure if I even fully believe that, my mother instead decided to try to bring up the border, Kamala, the usual deflections. This made it worse. <laughs> This is a good job my mom has, and I'm worried she's going to get herself fired if this happens again. This obsession with politics has got to be a mental illness. Many such cases. Many such cases. Is it actually a mental illness? I mean, read Foucault. What is a mental illness? Why are conservatives so obsessed over the border? Because they're taught to be. You still hear less about Q these days? Yeah, because the insanity and conspiracism of the QAnon cult has just transferred into the mainstream Republican Party. That's the reason why. The belief that, like, Donald Trump will come back and herald a grand, like, return of America, so on. It's like, all of this is just mainstream Republican ideology now. How do you get more conspiratorial than the mainstream Republican Party? Does this MAGA thing qualify as hysteria? I think it is objectively the case, like, 100% the case, that conservative politics will often lead you down roads. It will, it'll often lead you down a road where your behavior will begin to imitate the behaviors of people who would uh, get prescribed medication for what they do and for what they say uh, without actually having any psychological condition that warrants the prescription of that medication. Coming from Appalachia, changing my family's hurtful political views has been a rough battle. You can't demonize them or they won't listen at all, and you can't be too empathetic because you're verifying their thoughts. It's a thorough middle ground. I mean, have you had any success? Vosh, possibly that one VOD of yours that lives rent-free in my head 24-7 is the VOD years back where you went over the Oxford study proving conservatism and mental illness go hand in hand. Where conservatives have like um, a more developed fear response and worse processing power. Yeah, yeah. And lower IQ on average. Some of that is educational. Some of that is something that like develops over time. You know, if you're, if you're taught to be fearful all the time, your brain will develop to that, uh, you know, in line with that, I suppose. What do you do if your family needs medication for mental illness but refuses? See, this is the thing. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry, but you know, you have a finite life, and at the end of it, you're dead, and that's it, okay? You, you know the answer to some of these questions, don't you? You know the answer to some of these questions. It's a bitter pill to swallow. It really is. My mother, a big MAGA supporter, has really gotten to crystals and shit, lives on keto, takes weird pills she sees on TikTok, has a medium she makes regular phone calls to, she recently started her fight with cancer and refused to listen to her doctors and get chemo because they're all bad out. So now she's trying to find weird doctors that have the cure for cancer. Like, what can you even do at this point but throw your hands in the air? Yeah, it kind of sounds like she's running, she's running headlong into the grave and that's not your problem. Really sorry, it's a bitter pill to swallow. Much like the weird vitamin pills she probably gets off TikTok, but that's how it is. Your parents are adults. They're their own people. So are your friends. So is everyone else in your family, you know? Do you have any idea how wretched the life of your average Trump supporter would be if they lost contact with all of the non-Trump supporters in their life? My bet would be pretty wretched. They rely on us a lot more than they think, socially speaking. I, I really, really think that past the point, they just have to, they have to face the music. Do you think education reform? No, we're not talking systematic changes here. We're just talking about your personal behavior. You all want systematic solutions. Ain't happening. I agree, Vosh. I argued with my dad over the whole bullshit trans boxer thing with my father. He actually sided with me when I proved she was born female, only for him to reapproach later to try to convince me with all the bad faith data about testosterone. He just found new talking points to stay bigoted. Yeah, exactly. Because the talking points aren't what he's convinced by. They're a justifying mechanism. They're a way of him rationalizing post hoc the belief he already has. He might not strongly believe that 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 uh, 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 Iman 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 uh, yeah Iman uh, is uh, is transgender, but he does strongly believe that the media and news sources he got that information from are true. You know, 
Like, he's not super committed to that belief. He is committed to the belief that where he got that information from, that's a reliable source. So he'll come up with any justification whatsoever. This is why so often when you argue with reactionaries, it never feels like, like, with me, if I was making an argument on something policy-based, like, say, I wanted to make an argument that building more housing decreases the cost of housing. I would support that with data. And if someone came to me and they were like, Vosh, you fool, you haven't seen the most recent study. <laughs> and I read the study and it turns out I was wrong. That would kind of be that for my argument. I might be able to say something like, okay, well, it's one contrary study and I have four backing my point, but mm, that still bears investigation. I'm concerned by this. You know, I'm curious about it. That would kind of be it for like the, wi the wind under my wings, you know? But if you come up with a an argument like any specific position to counter what a Republican is saying about immigration, good luck, you'll be there for days because there is no position you can defeat that they cannot then support with another position. And if you stay in that argument long enough, they'll round back out to the beginning and they'll repeat arguments you've already debunked. That's happened to me in debates like 50,000 times. They'll go right back around. Eventually you're like, wait, hold on a second. We already addressed this. Or you're making points that are now contingent upon another point which I've already debunked being true, which it's not. So you can't make this argument anymore. You've lost the right to. You already conceded the earlier point. And then they'll say, well, I didn't concede it. I just said X. And then you'll say, no, you said Y. And we've already been over this. And you're caught forever. Because again, it's not about the arguments. It's about the feelings they have. So anyway, I guess my conclusion to all of this is try to move your right-wing friend or family member into an environment where it's more socially rewarding for them to not be a miserable, hateful piece of shit. Uh, you know, try to engage with them in a gracious and trustworthy way if possible, but if they are taxing you in your life, cut them off and hope that being cut off uh, will incentivize them to change their ways. Because if they really, guys, guys, if they really do love you, they'll probably change their behavior for you. Like if you're their kid and their commitment to being wrong is so strong that they will stay estranged from you forever in order to preserve that untruth, they probably weren't worth fighting over to begin with. And I'm really sorry it's a bitter pill to swallow, but that's the goddamn truth. That's the truth. It really sucks. But that's how it is. What about becoming embittered and estranged till they die? If they choose to do that, then that's on them. It's their choice. They're wrong. This is not a position where you guys are entering the equation with equal input. They're wrong. You're right. They're hateful. You're not. At least not in the context of this dynamic. If they want to ruin your relationship with them by behaving the way they're behaving and stay wrong, that's their choice to. If they can't be convinced and they can't have their environment moved, that's on them. That's on them. If you think maybe they're just like moderately disagreeable and they can be moved over, sure, but people don't email me for that. This is why Republicans are weird cuts so deep? Yeah, because to millions of Americans who are estranged to their like children or friends or whatever for being a weirdo right-wing dipshit, it cuts deep because it's a reminder that they're not just uh, wrong or hateful, uh, but that they're socially isolated. And a lot of them are. That's why it cuts deep. And it's true. It's completely true. Won't cutting them off reinforce the cult? I mean, they're voting Trump either way. Enabling them by continuing to, you know, uh, spend time with them when they're treating you poorly is uh, reinforcing it as well. Do you think this is how people should view all their relationships, not just with family? If your family member is with, like, a hateful, disagreeable piece of shit who's making your life worse, yeah, I think you should cut them off 100%. Of course, absolutely. Absolutely. It's objectively a better way to live, you know? There's nothing wrong with, like, really sticking it out for someone. But sticking it out through adversity and sticking it out through them being horrible to you are two different things. A family member or friend gets cancer and you, like, stay with them to help them? Cool. Great. Um, a, a family member decides that transgender people are groomers who are trying to, like, molest children and you're trans or have a trans friend or partner? Not great. Nuh-uh. You don't have to stick... You don't have to stick it out for people who are being antagonistic towards you. Well, sometimes that's how it is, Cthulhu. One might compare it to the metaphor of trying to save a person who's drowning only get pulled under yourself. Yeah, you know, apply the oxygen mask to yourself before the person next to you. I'm just saying, but teenagers and kids here cut off your abusive parents and then literally ghost their parents because they were caught stealing money. I have no idea what you're talking about, Max Lotus, but it sounds like you're incorporating experiences from your own life. 
Uh, I have no idea how this applies to the conversation at hand. What about my friend? He doesn't like trans people, but he's not super harsh about his transphobia and doesn't talk about it. But that's up to you. That's the point. It's up to you. That's my point. That's that's the point. It's your decision. You just have to have the strength to make it. That's it. People ask me, how do I change the mind of my family and friend? My answer is often you can't. And you make yourself miserable by, by pretending, by deluding yourself into thinking you're going to change their mind. How do you cut off a parent when you're in their house? You don't. You can't. I'm, ta I'm talking about, like, adults here. You have to wait. Sorry. You're a kid. You obviously have to wait. Yeah, very leftist question. That's true. Was the dynamic that different in 2020? In 2020, it was still really bad. After Jan 6, that was pretty much the turning point in terms of, like, the... After January 6 happened, a majority of Republicans believed it was bad that it happened. But then the right-wing propaganda mill started churning and saying that it was Antifa. And actually, the FBI set it all up. And actually, there was no violence at Jan 6. And it was a peaceful rally and so on and so forth. And then the Republican mind changed. At first, there was a moment of shame. But obviously, the Republicans didn't want that. So they changed. And now the vast majority of Republicans uh, think that it's overblown and they think that Trump actually won the election or some shit, you know? Um, it's it, it, like, that was kind of the turning point, you know? Their control of the narrative is insane. Well, Democrats are weak. Sorry, I was thinking. Editors, cut that bit out. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that rhetoric and the skill to apply it is not a... Um, it's a great band-aid, but it doesn't fix everything. I would never, at no point in me streaming have I been delusional enough to believe that I could just take anyone in, in my life or from the internet or whatever and change their mind on an issue because I just don't think most people are rational. I think that a lot of people, I, it's, it's literally human nature to rationalize. So no matter how good at arguing you get or like, oh, I used to be a 4 channer who was racist, but then when I turned 15, I became a feminist or whatever. Like, you know, whatever your background might be, I just think it's important to contextualize the ability to change people's minds in reality because sometimes I get emails from people who are like, yeah, so uh, my dad is pro Jan 6 and he believes in the, the, the storm. Anyway, do you think there's any way I can convince him? He keeps beating me and my brother. And I'm like, man... Come on, man. I can't bring a cat or something. This is so sad. Now, think of it in a positive context. I really do think a lot of people's lives would be improved if they summoned the moral courage to just drop or cut off their shitty family members and friends. Probably a lot of you could stand to. You know, you're thinking in the abstract right now. But um, there are a lot of shitty people out there, okay? And you have no obligation to, you know, eternally uh, tie yourself to them, you know, because, uh, well, for any reason, if they're, if they're being terrible to you. You're talking about rhetoric, not working with fascists. I'm exclusively talking about Trump support. That's what I'm talking about here. Not about arguing with liberals or leftists or whatever else. Have you tried uh, day drinking? An interesting proposal. Up thing is I do agree with Vosh about this point about ghosting abusive people. I'm just very much eh, you know, I wish I could ghost my shitty family. I see abusive people using this line of argument more than the victims. First of all, you can ghost your shitty family. Second of all, abusers almost never say this. Because abusers can't abuse you if they cut you off. Like, ab like people who engage in interpersonal abuse need the connection to abuse. If they keep cutting people off, they don't have it. There's nothing abusive about cutting people off. Yeah, abusers threaten to cut you off, but that's not the same as actually cutting you off. I have never heard of an abuser actually cutting a person off because then they can't be an abuser to them anymore. Threaten, yes. But you have to actually do it. I'm not telling you to threaten to cut off your family. I'm telling you to do it. Well, if you, if you want to. I'm telling you that you should if you, uh, if you want to. I'm not telling you to in, in all cases. That's not my, that's not my call to make. And though I have measures, well, speaking from experience, I do recommend waiting until after they pay for college before cutting off your parents. Yeah, yes, obviously, the pragmatics of the situation varies, of course, of course, of course. Yes, I don't disagree with that. You know, if you're living in their house, how can I cut off contact with living in their house? I don't know if you're joking, but you, you can't. If you're young enough that you want to, like, remove yourself from the situation but you can't because you still live with them or you're legally a dependent. You kind of just have to bide your time. Strong recommendation to young left-leaning or queer people if you live in an abusive household is just to, uh, you know, chill a bit. Even if it means waiting in the closet, sometimes that might be preferable because then once you're free, you're free. 
Uh, I mean, this very much varies like interpersonal. I'm not, again, like very like case by case, very much. I'm not your counselor. I can't make your decision for you, but be responsible, save money. Don't engage in any self-destructive behavior and understand that, uh, you know, little acts of rebellion against your parents that catch them on to you are probably more likely to do harm than good in the long run. You know, stop spending money on weed. Vosh, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I had some friends cut me off recently for being a lefty. Good. Now you're free of them. You should be thankful to them. Write them a letter. Would you ever want to be friends with people who would cut you off for being a lefty? Sounds to me like you were keeping poor company. They freed you uh, from the, uh, you know, the, the weight and responsibility of having to cut them off, if anything. 